computer. Okay, now more. Share screen. Okay, here are more. Share screen. And bring that down a bit. Okay, can we see, can we all see that now? Yeah. All right, you tell me, I'll leave you, Jill, to speak and uh, I will uh, move the slides uh, as we go. Can you see the slides? Yes. Can you, can you see them, Jill? I can't see the ones that are to come. But. No, no, no. I'll, I'll I'll click when you tell me when you want to, and I'll move that. <laughs> okay, Lord, we just lift this up to you and pray, Father, that you would help us to work through the technology, mm. and that everything will be coordinated. Mm. We want to give you glory through this, Lord, and lift your name high. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. And I hope this morning that you will be inspired about how God, how big our God is, um, but also challenged about our responsibility um, towards our cities and our nation. We have a big God, bigger than the trials that we face. Mm. So we thank you, Lord. Slide two. So I've, I've named this Taking Cities and Nations for Our God and uh, Our Authority in Christ. Uh, first of all, I want to encourage you. Um, in 1984, I was at the Orba Amagal Passion Play. The story of Orba Amagal is that in 1632, the bubon bubonic plague was raging through Europe. In 1633, the small town of Oberammergau in Bavaria, southern Germany, was badly affected. Almost every family had lost someone who had died. The town got together to implore God to spare them and vowed to perform a passion play to honour God if he would stop the plague. He did, and since Pentecost in 1634, they've faithfully carried out their vow, with the exception of World War II and coronavirus, which stopped it mm -hmm. temporarily. It is normally performed every 10 years on the year zero, from May to October, but I was able to go to a special performance which was the 350th anniversary. There are about 2,000 actors, all from the village. So the whole village puts its heart into this passion play and they train for 10 years to perform their roles. And it uh, thankfully doesn't stop at the cross, but it goes on to the resurrection. Hallelujah. So they tell the whole gospel story and incorporate Old Testament um, stories as well, mirroring the fulfillment, next slide, Graham, the fulfillment from uh, the Old Testament to the New Testament. So they're really drawing the whole of scripture together. It's very well performed and it really does glorify God. They have literally hundreds of thousands that come to see it. And they're retelling the story of the God who saved their little village when they cried out to him when there was a, a plague of illness that was afflicting their little town of Orma Amagal. Another story was during World War II. Next slide. Derek Prince 
was serving in the British Army in North Africa in 1941 to 1943. The officers above him were abusing their power and serving their own interests, while the foot soldiers were being forced to retreat 700 miles in great humiliation. As a new Christian with little fellowship, he felt he could not bless these bad leaders. So he asked God to give him a prayer he could genuinely pray. God breathed into his spirit this prayer. Lord, give us leaders such that it will be for your glory to give us victory through them. The Brits decided to remove the commander and replaced him. But their choice was in a plane that got shot down and he was killed. <laughs> Churchill then speedily, um, without really consulting a lot of other people, put Montgomery in charge. He was a just and God-fearing man who restored discipline to the troops and within two months got them organized and lifted their spirits. And before the Battle of Al Alamein, he asked his officers to pray together with him that Almighty God would give them the victory. He did, and it turned the course of war. God had also answered the prayer that he'd put in Derek Prince's heart. At the same time, in a Bible college in Wales, there was another army interceding on their knees, praying for God's protection for Israel. Next slide. During the threat of invasion of yeah. Hitler's forces... Oh, I yeah. pressed the wrong button. My apologies, Jill. Yeah, that's it. During the threat of invasion of Hitler's forces on Britain, Rhys Howes and his students had been interceding for at least four hours a day, one hour in the morning and then three hours at night. And at times they spent all day in prayer. God required them to get their hearts right, their own hearts right, and to hear from him clearly and then pray with faith, even when things look grim on the ground. Howells knew that if Hitler invaded Britain, they would be slaves to a monster dictator. They could not surrender, so he was not praying for an end to the war. He also knew that if the Germans were not turned back at El Alamein, the Jews would not be safe. So they were contending for the destiny of nations to be fulfilled. In 1863, in the United States, there was a civil war raging. Like in the days of Esther, the nation's destiny hung in the balance. Next slide. Abraham Lincoln called a national day of humiliation, prayer and fasting. And immediately after this, the tide turned at Gettysburg on July the 3rd and the war was won but it is so amazing what he called the nation to. I'll put some of it up there, but I'll read it. Whereas the Senate of the United States, devoutly recognizing the supreme authority and just government of almighty God in all the affairs of men and nations, has by a resolution requested the present president to designate and set apart a day of national prayer and humiliation. And whereas it is the duty of nations as well as of men to own their depend to owe their own their dependence upon the overruling power of God, to confess their sins and transgressions in humble sorrow, yet with assured hope that genuine repentance will lead to mercy and pardon, and to recognize the sublime, sublime truth announced in the Holy Scriptures and proven by all history that those nations only are blessed whose God is the Lord. We have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth and power as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us 
and we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to the God that made us. It behooves us then to humble ourselves before the offending power, to confess our national sins and to pray for clemency and forgiveness. What an amazing statement. And to think that that was a government official statement to which the Senate agreed. God answered their prayers and he restored peace to the USA. How far our nations have fallen since then, when that was government policy to speak in those sort of terms and acknowledge God in that sort of way. But we can be encouraged because what God did then, he can do today because he is the same yesterday, today and forever. We are called to be a kingdom of priests. And Derek Prince points out in his wonderful little book that I've been reading, Shaping History Through Prayer and Fasting, or rather rereading, because I think I've read it twice before, <laughs> but it's always relevant, especially in times like these, that we cannot separate the whole idea of kingdom and priests. They belong together. Our right to rule is connected to our authority as priests. And the duty of a priest is to intercede on behalf of men before God and also the opposite, God before men. He gave us authority and we need to use it. Next slide. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you from Luke 10, 19, as the Lord sent his disciples out into the world. Whether we face a physical war or a health war as now, God holds us, his church, responsible to rule and reign with Christ, not on our own authority. And our answer is always the same as it was. Next slide. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land and send a plague among my people or send a plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways and I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Firstly, our job is to humble ourselves, which in um, Hebrew terms means to not only pray, but it means to, um, to fast and it means to repent as on the day of atonement. Then we have to pray and we have to seek his face and we have to turn from our wicked ways. And this is all said to his people, my people, not to an unbelieving nation. So it's when we, the church, um, obey those, those, all of those requirements, then we start to see a uh, change in our nation. Where the church goes, so goes the nation. Satan must first find a loophole amongst us before he can attach the attack the nation. For we are the nation's gatekeepers. Actually, that in Hebrew, that's um, connected. That thought is connected to the word uh, for Christian, not Srim. Netzer, not Srim. Judgment first starts in the church as well. 1 Peter 4.17 says, For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. If it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? When God begins to judge a nation, he judges the gods of the nation. Next slide. 
as he did in Egypt. Exodus 12, 12 says, on the same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. So every one of those plagues was connected with something that the people worshipped. So what are the gods in our society? Next slide. Money, business, busyness, science, pharmacy, medicine, education, sport, sex, drinking, technology, environment, entertainment are just a few of the, those things. Many of these, of course, are not intrinsically wrong. And we are certainly grateful for the advances in medicine and science. But when these displace God from being Lord, then we have an idol. Where we spend our time, our money and our effort shows us what we worship. What happened when Pharaoh was confronted by Moses? He turned to his soothsayers to try to re reproduce the miracles and find the answers but they could not. What happened when COVID hit? We likewise turned to our gods and tried to keep, keep worshipping the same idols. We blamed our leaders and criticised them for not doing things right. But did the nation turn to God? Um, I can't see that really happening yet. In certain circles, yes. The efforts of the virus, effects of the virus are indeed associated with, with bringing us to our knees and back to God in many ways. The economy has been hit very hard. Education has been grossly disrupted. Sports stopped for a while and then continued without crowds. Pubs, restaurants and cafes are closed. Entertainment has ground to a halt. And the environment, well, we do have clean, cleaner air. So that's really good. Mm -hmm. We shouted to our medical experts to provide answers and turned to pharmacy to provide a cure. In the lockdowns, we've had more time for God, more time for family, immediate family at least, and had to rethink our priorities and our finances. We've had to consider what is really important. Perhaps the lockdowns have caused us to value relationships more and realize that we are not so in control of our world as we thought. Perhaps it's also shown us many of the things that we put in the place of God or before God. I tend to think, and certainly in my heart, you know, I've, I've been chafing at the bit on certain things and had to stop and think, well, Maybe I'm not putting God first. I'm, I'm really wanting some of these things, these things back that we used to be able to enjoy. Um, but I've had to stop and think, well, have I really been putting those things ahead of God? And God is trying to pull me back into line. So perhaps the above has, has drawn our attention to the fact that we still carry much of God and of Greek culture within our genes. Do we really trust God to follow Jesus and follow Jesus or has the pandemic shown us that we do yearn for things that are not necessarily putting God's kingdom first? There's a few things that the Lord has um, drawn my attention to that I do believe are keys. Uh, next slide. Yeah, that's been my case over <laughs> much of the last year. <laughs> Next one. Pandemic is a Greek word, or actually two Greek words, pan and demos. Pan meaning all and demos meaning pe people, if I'm correct with that, Graham. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, um, the... Uh, um... The pain is right. The demos. Um, uh, I'm not sure, Patty. Uh, uh, well, that's where we get democracy from and all sorts of other 
I understand polis is more useful, usually people or ethnos. Um, in, interesting. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm. It's. Uh, uh, I'm not sure that's in the New Testament Greek uh, as people. Anyway, that's yeah. what I read. <laughs> Good. And it means relating to all people, not just something which is in a limited area, but stems. But it actually stems. This was what I was reading from the god Pan, who was not just a god for some of the aristocracy but he was a god for all people. Pan was a god not of the city, and he never had any temples, but he was a god of the countryside, the woods, the wild places. He was also the god of sheep and shepherds and of rustic music. So it's from that we get pan pipes, mm. which you can see in that picture. He was uh, depicted as we see there, as being half goat from the waist down and half human. And um, humanism, well, the, most of the Greek gods were in the form of a human, but this one was a bit of an exception. And humanism actually came out of Greek thinking. But uh, Pan also had... Um, goat's horns on his head. And I think that that is connected with um, the Greek knowledge. The Greeks had a great desire for knowledge and they're of course very famous for their philosophy. <clears throat> Greek is depicted in Daniel as a goat, which is interesting. And um, Pan was known to be ugly. <laughs> And I think you see in that picture that he, he does look very demonic. Pan was shrewd and deceiving. He could turn inanimate objects into different forms. And we have seen with this COVID, there's been much deception about the virus and about the vaccines, and it has transformed itself into several variants. Pan was strong, fast, and could run long distances. And so is a virus. Pan could teleport himself from Earth to, uh, to Mount Olympus. And we've also seen the virus that's been transported across the globe. And in Daniel 8, we find that the uh, the the Greek ruler was insolent. He was skilled in intrigue. So we see that shrewdness and deception. He was arrogant. He was destructive. And he opposed the prince. In verse 24 in Daniel 8, he was also strong and destructive. But in Daniel 8.25, the ruler of Greece would would destroy in an extraordinary degree, to an extraordinary degree, and oppose the Prince of Princes, but he is broken without human agency. So that's encouraging. There's a story about Pan, that during a war, he helped a friend survive a vicious struggle by letting out a piercing cry that frightened the enemy and caused him to flee. From this story, it is said that we get the word panic, the definition of which is the sudden uncontrollable fear that leads people into irrational behavior. <laughs> well, that sounds a bit like the pandemic also. Next slide. In ancient Israel, Pan was worshiped at Caesarea Philippi. And you can see there a lovely spot with water. And it, right there in those pools is actually a spring, which is one of the sources of the Jordan River. But you will, can also see in the distance there a cave, a big cave. And it was into that cave that babies were thrown to their death to worship fan, Pan. 
So um, child sacrifice ha happened at this spot. Mm -hmm. And it is therefore known as the gates of hell. And it's here that Jesus took his disciples, told in Matthew 16, verses 13 to 19, that uh, he asked them who they thought the Son of Man was or who men thought that the Son of Man was. And then who they thought the Son of Man was. And Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. So it's right here at the gates of hell that Jesus promises what's happening. Uh, having a bit of trouble here with the, uh, I was trying to uh, get the size back. My apologies. There you go. Next slide. So in the rocks, that's the big cave on the left, and you can see all these niches in the rocks. That's where they used to put their, their um, sacrificial things, their offerings to the God Pan. It's right here that God promises to build his church upon this confession that he is the Messiah and that the gates of hell would not overpower it. So the keys of the kingdom of heaven were given right at this spot to bind and to loose. In other words, to make legal, legal decrees in line with God's will that affect people and nations. Uh, in the face of the pandemic, we must use those keys that we have been given. And I think it's very interesting that it's right at the gates of hell. It's right in the worst possible situations that God gives us keys which we can use. So another thing that the Lord has been showing me. Next slide. <clears throat> The time, the length of time that Israel stayed in exile was determined by the land, how the land having its Sabbaths. It was associated with the Sabbath years, the Shemitah and the Jubilees years. And it was for breaking the covenant with God that they would go into exile. Now there was 490 years where the Sabbath year and the Jubilees were not kept. And they spent 70 years in exile so the land could restore its Sabbaths. Now, this concept comes from Leviticus 26, verses 33 to 35, where it says, I will scatter you among the nations and will draw out my sword and pursue you, and your land will be laid waste and your cities will lie in ruins. Then the land will enjoy its Sabbath years all the time that it lies desolate and you are in the country of your enemies. Then the land will rest and enjoy its Sabbaths. All the time that it lies desolate, the land will have the rest it did not have during the Sabbaths you lived in it. And 2 Chronicles 36, 21, the land enjoyed its Sabbaths all the time of its desolation it rested until the 70 years were completed in fulfillment of the word of the Lord spoken to Jeremiah. Now, in Jonathan Kahn, in his book uh, about the Shemitah, he talks about this concept. And it's, he says, um, to abandon or reject the Shemitah, that's the seventh, seventh year when the land was to rest, is to say to God, quite, everything we have in our lives comes not from God, but from the work of our hands. Nor does it belong to God, but to us. We will not sacrifice profit or gain for the sake of pursuing God. It set in motion a series of far-reaching consequences and repercussions. If God is not sovereign over the land and its people, then the land and its people become cut off from the creator. A God-centered worldview is replaced by a man-centered and self-centered worldview. So the people drove God out of their lives to become their own gods, masters of the land, their world and their destiny. They could now rewrite the law and redefine what was right and wrong, moral and immoral. Without God, nothing would be holy or for that matter, unholy. Nothing had any purpose except the purpose they now assigned it. 
and with no true purpose, they could do whatever they wanted, not only with the land, but also with their lives, with each other and with their children. Thus, they lifted up their children as sacrifices, mm. altars of foreign gods. And it was for this last transgression that the judgment finally fell. It began with the breaking of the Shemitah and it ended in the offering of sons and daughters in the fires of Baal and Molech, the sin that would bring the nation's destruction. That's quoted from the mystery through the Shemitah, pages 38 to 39. When we don't trust God, we have to provide for ourselves. When given the Sabbath command in the desert, some immediately went out on the Sabbath to look for food that was not there. The Sabbath year not only brought freedom to the people and the restoration of the land, but also gave the land its rest. God dearly wants our company, and that means our time. Time is probably our most precious commodity, both towards God and others. And as a result of pondering this whole concept, I did some research on when Australia reneged on having Sunday as a special day, being, um, you know, we know that Saturday is actually the biblical Sabbath, but Sunday had been used to, by the British to replace that, and with some, some reasonable um, uh, justification in that Sunday being the day the Lord rose on, the first day of the week. But um, anyway, this research um, led me to, to see that most um, shops were closed and everyone had time for God and family. Certainly when I was a child, that was the case. And this... Um, Regression happened gradually, but Sunday trading first began in Victoria in 1991, in part. The CBD was added in 1992, some tourist precincts in 1993, and it was totally deregulated in 1996, except for Christmas, Good Friday and Anzac Day. So that's quite a few Sabbaths between then and now that we have missed. What started with a throwing out of a special day for God in our nation has also ended up in massive child sacrifice in the form of abortion. Perhaps it's also worth noting that the pandemic originated in the very country that legislated the one child policy and forced mothers to abort their children, mm -hmm. namely China. But if God could have 10 righteous in Sodom, he would have spared the city. That means that we have a mandate, a responsibility and an authority to defeat the devil in Jesus' name and to intercede on behalf of our cities. Next slide. Jeremiah tells us that we are to pray for the welfare of the city in which we reside. to, quote, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I've carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. And that's a biblical principle. Mm. We're facing a David and Goliath battle. <clears throat> and Goliath is winning at the moment. But God wants a Davidic army. Next slide who know their God and will refuse to allow their minds to be dulled and controlled by the secular humanism of our day. At first, when COVID struck, there was a national day of prayer and fasting. And again, last Sunday, there was another. But we must keep up our prayers and not retreat and not come under the spirit of this age, accepting that what is, is what has to be. We need to believe that God will answer our prayers and drive back the enemy from our shores. We are here for such a time as this. God does not need a majority, but he calls those who will join in faith. David was a shepherd boy who played anointed music and worshiped the true God. What a contrast to Pan. <laughs> 
need to overcome this Goliath in a pandemic. Next slide. Is anything too hard for me? We need to draw a bloodline over our land and tell Goliath thus far and no further. God is bigger than Goliath and he can turn this monster around and send it into the sea. We need to declare God's word and rise up in faith saying, how dare you defy the armies of the living God? We need to plead the blood of Jesus over ourselves, our households, our nation. We can come against this enemy. Um, next slide. Oh. And declare, if you would like to declare it with you, with me, or maybe I should just, well, no, you need to declare it. <laughs> Some of you aren't on mute, sir. Um, you want us on mute for that or not? Yeah, otherwise it's going to be all over the place, I think. Um, this is straight from what David told Goliath. You come against me with sword, mm -hmm. human knowledge, and spear, yes. threats, and javelin, fear. But I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This very day, I give you the carcasses of the Philistine secular yeah. army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, but the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. Next. God can give us the victory and we have to stand in his name. Goliath is not bigger than him. Amen. We thank you, Lord, that you are sovereign. You call us to be gatekeepers over our nation. And what we allow in will come in and what, what we don't allow in will stay out. And what we reject in our cities and say, this is not of God. We will not let you come in. We have that authority. And we thank you, Lord, that it is not in our strength or in our power that we win, but it is in your strength and your will as we align with you and it was as we stand with you, we declare, Lord God, we declare health over our people. Mm -hmm. We declare a bloodline over our own lives and our households that so this enemy will pass over and not destruct, bring destruction in our households or in our lives. We thank you, Lord, that we have the blood protection of Jesus who has died for mm -hmm. us yes. as we take mm -hmm. communion each week, Lord God, or maybe each yes. day. Father, that your protection will keep us safe. Mm -hmm. And we declare to this enemy that is trying to stride across our nation and bringing hopelessness and despair <laughs> into so many people's lives, Lord God, and so many young children, Father, mm -hmm. that are being affected and, and are, are in despair, Lord, because they can't get back to school and they can't see their friends. Mm. They can't even go to a playground, Lord God. We ask, Father, that you would turn the tide of this, this monster in our land. You would send him into the sea and put up a, a, um, a millstone around its neck, Lord God, so that it cannot resurface off our land. We stand and declare that Jesus is Lord over our land. Mm -hmm. And we thank you, Father, that your power is greater. And Lord, we ask, Lord, that you would give wisdom to our leaders, that you would give, um, that, that you would uncover the deception that is taking place in our nation, Lord, when the answer is there and it is cheap, Father. And we declare that, that Big Pharma will not have the same the, the say in our nation, Lord God, but that these cheap, um, reliable 
answers that are already there and already approved, Lord God, will be released in our nation so that people can be protected and that it's not all money going into um, people's pockets. It's not all about money, Lord, but it really truly is about people's health, that this will come to the surface. Mm -hmm. And Lord, that the gagging of our media will, that they will be ungagged to, to present the truth that people may know Father, that the answer is there and will not be um, forced to lose their jobs or, or to come up under the, the deception that is, that is out there, Lord God. We, we pray, Father, that your name will be exalted across this, this land. Amen. And Lord, we ask forgiveness where we have been slack, where I have been slack, Lord God, Amen. in coming before you daily and declaring that you are sovereign and taking up this challenge and declaring what is okay. allowed and what is not allowed in our nation, Father. And we tell this virus, Lord, to get lost off our land, bring health and happiness uh, and to bring um, the gospel of Jesus Christ back into our nation, Lord, so that people will not be ashamed of the gospel, but they will know that it is the answer for mankind and for our nation. We want to give you all the glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Oh, wow. Lord, I would like to pray, Lord, at this time, as Jill said, this time is what it is, that people who are in despair, who are using the internet more and more, will come across you. Lord, you um, can use technology. You can use all sorts of things, Lord. Mm. The people who are feeling hopelessness, restlessness, a, th a thought of what, what is my life worth? What am I doing? Lord, that you will bring them yourself across their path any way you choose. Yes. Lord, through the internet, through Facebook, through whatever, Lord, mm. that they can have a deep and meaningful encounter with you, Lord, at this time. Lord, you knew this virus was coming and you can bring good out of evil. Amen. Lord, many good things have come out of it. People wanting yes. to connect with their families more, people appreciating mm. um, beauty and um, each other. So, Lord, we pray at this time that those who are lost, and there are so many who are lost, will find you somehow in this, in this season. Yes, Lord, we agree. Jesus' name. Mm. Do you want to stop recording, Graham? Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do.